Hi guys, my name is Yi Chao, and I'm here with Richard Garfield, inventor of the game Magic the Gathering. Uh, it's so great to have you here. Thanks so much for joining us for Extra Life this year. That's a pleasure. Uh, so I just wanted to ask you some questions that some of our uh, donors and players had for you, and we we'll, wanted to chat with you a little bit about magic and uh, questions that people are excited to ask. So we'll just jump right in. Uh, one of the first questions we got was, uh, which card in the entire Magic multiverse would uh, you think of, think of yourself being, and why? Well, I guess for me the answer is uh, pretty easy since they made uh, a Garfield PhD as a card, <laughs> and uh, um, the mechanics on that card are, are pretty crazy since it can be used to play any card in the game, and, uh, and it's got my picture on it. So uh, I think uh, I think I'd have to go with that one. That's pretty fair. If there's a card that is literally you, I guess that would be. You. <laughs> um, if you could add a magic card to Alpha, what card would you add? That's a that's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, Alpha worked really well uh, for what it was trying to do, but there were a number of moments in future sets where I thought, "Wow, those are really cool cards." Um, so. And, and I, I particularly like metagame types of cards, so I really like Shahrazad, but I wouldn't add Shahrazad to the first uh, the first set. Uh, so I really like cards like Magical Hack and Sleight of Mind in, in the Alpha set, um, because they sort of played with the rules of them themselves. Mm. So uh, if I were gonna add a card, um, well, I, I, I guess, even though I really like these metagame cards, the cards that comes to mind are thing, things like Lobotomy and uh, um, uh, my, uh, Memory Lapse, uh, which are, I, I don't know how particularly powerful they're viewed as these days, but uh, I really liked how clean those mechanics were. Mm. And, uh, and so they were, uh, they were pretty nice. I also like cards with humor too. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, if there's a, a, a card that struck me as humorous, uh, I might I might add a little more humor to the game. Uh, um, one along those lines is, uh, uh, you know what I would add? Hmm. Here's here's my real answer. Nah. Uh, there's a, a, go a card I designed fairly late in the game uh, called Goblin Sharpshooter. Mm. And uh, it had a wonderful, to me, a wonderful uh, feel to it. Uh, it's a it's a little guy, and you tap him uh, to do a point of damage to somebody, and he doesn't untap uh, the regular way. He untaps only when a creature dies, mm. and so that gave the, this wonderful feeling because if you had a bunch of one one creatures, you could brrr, mow them all down. Right. And uh, if uh, after a battle, a few people might only have one hit point left, brrr, he could mow them down. Um, and uh, and so I, I felt it was funny. It had a great flavor, and my only regret with it was that it was named Goblin Sharpshooter rather than Goblin Gatling Gunner, which is what I wanted. And if it was in the first set, it would have been the Gatling Gunner. Oh, okay. I still, it still has the picture of the Gatling Gun. So. Right, yeah, that's true. Sharpshooter for goblins, I guess. It's just spray and pray. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have a magic card that is your favorite, and uh, or a magic card that you're most proud of? Um, I really like Scheherazade, as I uh, just mentioned. Um, <laughs> And uh, the reason I like it, I, I did uh, the expansion Arabian Nights almost entirely on my own. Wow. And uh, um, I, I read a lot of Arabian Nights in preparation for that. And I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to capture the spirit of what I was reading in cards. And um, people may not realize you know, so how, how much of the stuff is sort of, to my mind, authentic. In that, uh, for instance, uh, the, 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 the names like Nafs, Asp, Nafs is a, a word, I forget what it means, but uh, I took all these words from the, uh, from the versions of Arabian Nights that I was reading. Uh, so anyway, uh, Scheherazade was a, a sticky point with me because I really wanted her in the game, but uh, it's re it was really hard for me to figure out what was the essence of Scheherazade and how to bring that to magic, and eventually, I came up with this idea that, that while Scheherazade was always telling stories within stories, uh, in magic, she could make it so you were playing games within games. Mm. And so when you play Scheherazade, you begin a sub-game, and the winner of that sub-game uh, gets an advantage. And, uh, and uh, so anyway, you won't see any cards like these anymore because <laughs> they're super 
unusable for tournaments. <laughs> right. But uh, for casual play, they were a lot of fun. Oh, I bet. Where you get a game within a game within a game, and mm -hmm. just goes There's, on. There was even a, a, a killer deck built around it, which uh, amused me. Which uh, <laughs> So... Uh, uh, you can certainly take this out if I run too long with it, but I love this uh, this story. Uh, you could actually use it for my answer of an amazing game, although this didn't actually happen. This is just uh, hypothetical. Uh, the the Scheherazade, when you play it, you start a sub game, and whoever loses that sub game, I believe, loses half their life. And it's been a while since I've seen the card. <laughs> and, and so in those days, you, you could play with any cards you wanted. You didn't have a limit of four. And so there was a, a hypothetical deck put together with a bunch of uh, uh, planes and Mox Pearls and Scheherazades. And it was just a big deck. <laughs> so that it wouldn't uh, lose by shuffle pressure at the very end uh, by being decked. And so what would happen is on the second or third turn, no matter what was going on in this game, a sub game would start and you and you start a new game. And no matter what was happening in that game, a sub game would start. <laughs> and what would happen in that game, a sub game would start. And so you get these nested sub games, and about the eighth sub game, you're going to run your opponent out of cards. And you've made a big enough deck that you won't. So now in that sub, 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 sub game, they have half their life. So right. then you play another game, and you run them out of cards. And in that sub, 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 sub game, they lose half their life. And you, you keep on doing this, and eventually in that sub, 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 sub game, they die. And then in the sub, 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 sub game, they lose half their life. So the result was that this deck, would win, provided it uh, uh, won most of the, or could stall long enough, mm -hmm. would win after about 30,000 games. <laughs> wow, that's pretty mind-blowing. Yeah, I think that's one of the things about Magic that really excites me is that it opens up all these possibilities and even these like hypothetical things that you really wouldn't consider and it gives so many players the opportunity to be really kind of um, smart about figuring out these puzzles and taking the rules that exist and finding ways to subvert them into creating these unique kind of game states. Um, when you were originally uh, designing Magic, uh, what was some of the inspiration behind these like rules? Like for example, how did you, here's a question from one of our fans was, how did you choose the five lands associated with the five colors, and was that ever different at any point? You know, uh, I usually put the beginning of magic as a uh, 1990, uh, maybe two or three years before magic was published. And at that point, uh, I had this idea for trading card game, and it took me a while to, to maybe six months before I came up with a framework for Magic. Um, but that framework itself was taken from um, uh, games I've been designing all through the 80s. And so, and, 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 and this five colors concept was throughout them. Mm -hmm. So uh, it goes very far back in my uh, amateur game design. And, uh, um, I think the first place it came about, there was a book called The Master of the Five Magics, and I think I made, like when I was in high school, a game based on that. Mm. And, uh, and, over, uh, and so that's probably, you know, that might be where, where I first had the idea of five. And I don't remember, I think the relationship between uh, land and mana came about sometime in the early 80s, and it might have stemmed from... Uh, King of the Tabletop. There was a a, 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 a game in, in Dragon, which uh, in which there was land and there were creatures, and they were sort of separated. Anyway, uh, all my games are generally a process of evolution, and so mm -hmm. it goes very far back and is uh, intertwined with lots of uh, other games. And uh, and and I don't think it ever changed in that. I don't think there was ever. I, I think the natures of the different colors changed, sure. uh, but uh, but more they sort of uh, were added on to by intuition over the years. It was a lot of time, a long time before, uh, uh, there were many features of the magics that I didn't really understand until after it was even published. Like uh, I hadn't connected the dots and realized, oh, you know what? I always put that in, in this color. And mm. that's, you know, that for some reason, I think that's resonant with whatever the nature of that is. Um, so, so there you are. Yeah, I think that's always really interesting, the tension between 
going with intuition behind your designs and then seeing the connections later on and then emphasizing and amplifying that out. Yeah, I think that's a, exactly the process uh, uh, that was done with the, the, color, the Colors of Magic. Very cool. Uh, is there any inspiration for a new plane that you would want to see in Magic's future, a, a plane of, that we haven't visited? Uh, I, I'm afraid I, I don't even really understand the question uh, mm. because I've never been, um, I, I, don't, I don't understand how the planes and magic work really. <laughs> um, I, I have lots of ideas for new mechanics and flavors uh, and I don't, ha I don't know how that ties into uh, the world of, uh, of, uh, of magic these days. Um, so, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, so I, I don't really know how to answer that. I, I like uh, bluffing and uh, um, hidden information types of mechanics and uh, usually when I'm involved with the design team I'm trying to figure out how to get some more of that in. Okay. Uh, and. Uh, Bluffing and hidden information is definitely in magic, um, but uh, you have to be usually a better player to access it. Uh, and that, that's the way it is with a lot of games. Um, uh, but there are some games where the bluffing is very low hanging fruit, like in poker. Mm -hmm. Even if you're bad at poker, you can bluff. Right. And, uh, and so uh, getting cards which uh, allow people to bluff is, even if they're not such great players, is, is, uh, is something I really like. And I, I certainly wouldn't mind, a, I guess, a plane which uh, had a lot of that going on. Okay. Uh, do you have, uh, for you, when you first set out to design Magic in, in the early days, uh, did you come at the game more from a game mechanic point of view or an idea of a cool effect or, or, or a moment or, or spell and then kind of create it that way? Um, as a game designer, I'm, I think I'm pretty flexible in those two approaches. Uh, I, I have games I can point to and say that was mechanics. Flavor came later. And uh, uh, I have games where, you, where, where I had this idea of something I've seen or, or, or thought of, which was entirely flavor, and I put mechanics around it. Um, I, I think I like to uh, marry those two though more than a lot of other designers. Uh, once, if I've got a game which is very mechanical, like for example, King of Tokyo was uh, a very mechanical game mm. uh, in its origin, um, when I uh, figure out what the theme is, because originally in King of Tokyo I didn't have the theme of monsters smashing Tokyo, um, <laughs> Then I go back and I completely redesign it based on that idea. I don't just uh, mm. paint it on. Right. And if I've got uh, a theme in mind, then after I figure out the mechanics, uh, I often have to change the theme. So uh, I do a lot of back and forth. But bringing that back to magic, I think it was driven uh, at the first level from mechanics. Um, I, I uh, and, and 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 I think. In general, that's what I like to do: is, is come up with mechanics that I really like, and then figure out how the theme resonates with that. Um, and uh, and I remember uh, back in the very early days of Magic, uh, uh, wrestling with people for who the flavor didn't resonate with the mechanics. Uh, so, for example, there were a lot of uh, uh, there were a lot of people who didn't like the fact that if they had a vampire and they attacked, the other person couldn't block because they want to walk, because they have whatever lure, so they have to block. And, uh, uh, or, or they want their healing spells not to go over 20 because, uh, but, but for me, it's like if the game is more natural, pl naturally played in that way, we're going to craft the world so that that makes sense. And so healing didn't cap at 20. It just felt better if you could, uh, if there wasn't healing wounds plus gaining life, but that it was all one thing. And it, was, it made more sense that, to me that uh, you don't have a rule that you can sometimes allow your vampires to walk and sometimes, the, but the other times they have to fly. It's like, um, if, it, if the mechanics make sense, then the world makes sense. And that's sort of why I chose magic to begin with is because you can craft your conception of magic around whatever mechanical mm. uh, world you make. Very cool. Great, so another question one of our donors had was uh, if you have a story of how magic has changed someone's life for the better. 
I, I don't have a specific story I can point to, but uh, but I, I've received the same story many times, which uh, um, is uh, generally from a parent, and they have uh, had trouble with their children because uh, because they weren't learning to read uh, effectively or they weren't socializing. And with magic, uh, whichever one of those problems, or if they had both of those problems, uh, th they would just disappear. Um, and, and I think that's often because uh, motiv if you're motivated for something, you, you, you will learn it. And uh, what's missing in a lot of people when they're growing up is the motivation, uh, and that doesn't come around until a lot later. Right. Uh, um, but uh, but for instance, reading is pointless if uh, if you're not getting anything out of it, and if the only thing you're getting out of it is the teacher says good job, you know that motivates some people but not others. But if you've got a magic card and you 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 can't understand how to play it unless you can read it, you are motivated to learn. And uh, it's the same thing with dealing with uh, other people, making friends. This gives a a lot of people have difficulty with what. Um, Social, social socialization is a very complicated thing. It comes more naturally to some people than others, and games provide an excellent framework uh, with which people can operate safely. And mm -hmm. uh, and I'm I'm sure, in fact, that's part of my appeal. Uh, uh, it, one of the things I find appealing in games is when I when I've got a large. I think at my heart, I'm introverted, and uh, and one of my ways of uh, dealing with people and. and Interacting with them is through games, and I've uh, I learned a lot through uh, you know my, my uh, uh, pulling out games uh, as a method of uh, interacting with people. Very cool. Um, another question one of our donors had is: uh, Do you have uh, a favorite memory about magic, or the design, or the playing, or, or just over the years? Hmm. Well, I've, I've, uh, certainly, of course, I've got lots and lots of memories. Favorites are always hard to yeah, uh, picking the one favorite. Hard to pick yeah. out. Uh, um, but I'll, I'll I'll pick out a, a story uh, I've, uh, for now that I that I liked a lot, which was the time I uh, I won a game uh, by bluffing concession. <laughs> and uh, it was one of my proudest gaming moments, which uh, was I was playing against somebody, and from our matchup of deck, I knew that uh, that uh, if I played my flo my fog, and therefore ignored combat damage, that I was going to end up losing the game. Um, but if I played it when he attacked, and he used a lot of his one turn creature pumps, like he has giant growth and berserks and all this stuff. So like if I could use my fog to get rid of those, then then I would probably win. And and so he hit me with his vampire, and I didn't fog. And the next turn he hit me with his vampire, and I didn't fog. And the next turn he hit me with the vampire and didn't fog. And he wasn't playing all those cards because he also knew that if I played fog, uh, if I played fog and got rid of those cards, that he was going to lose. So finally, I'm down to four life, and he hits me with his creature. And I don't fog, and he goes, "Oh, okay. Well, then I'm going to giant growth, giant growth, berserk, berserk, and uh, do 30 points of damage." Even though, of course, he didn't have to. Right. Uh, he could have just said, "Okay, I win." Flashy finishing but blow. I, I, I thought there was some chance he was going to uh, try to gloat in, and I said, "Oh, well, then I'll fog." And he goes, "Well, you can't do that." And I said, "No, I can't. I can react to your your things." And so I fogged, and <laughs> the berserk killed his uh, his creature, oh, and, right. uh, and uh, I ended up winning the game. <laughs> That's awesome. So that's, I guess that's a lesson of don't go for the fancy play, that's right. play to win. If you've won the game, stop. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, another uh, donor wanted to know, um, uh, do you see Planeswalker cards as having improved the game, and would you have included them in your original design? Uh, I absolutely wouldn't have included them in the original design. Um, uh, they, are, they require... A good knowledge. Of, they're, they're, they've got a high complexity budget. I like to view games as being uh, uh, as having a complexity budget, and uh, you can only make it so complex. And what you want to do is get the best uh, the best results for that. Right. Uh, and so you don't add 
uh, something which adds a little bit of complexity if it adds hardly any anything to the game. Uh, sure. And uh, um, you uh, and so if you add something with a lot of complexity, you want to make sure it's giving a lot. Uh, so I, I don't think they would have worked at all in the first set. Now, when it was released. I still probably wouldn't have done it, but they've proven to be, uh, you know, people do get a lot out of them. And, uh, and, uh, and so I would categorize those as very complex. Maybe they're worth the budget. <laughs> um, and I'm always excited to see what the uh, design teams come up with. And, uh, and uh, there certainly has, it's been proven that there's a lot of things you can do with Planeswalkers. Yeah, definitely. Uh, do you still play Magic and draft Magic? And uh, a, a player wants to know, do you have a favorite set for drafting Magic? Um, I do play and draft Magic. Uh, m mostly I draft. Uh, I, I, it's been a while since I've made any decks. And uh, um, the usually when I draft, it is not from a particular set. I've got this large box of just random <laughs> stuff. Uh, you just don't know what's in it. And I usually <laughs> grab uh, handfuls of this and draft it out. And uh, um, and whenever I'm a part of a draft somewhere else, I keep my cards. I throw them in that. So that's what we that's what we work with. That's awesome. The ultimate chaos cube creation amalgamation. Yeah. Very fun. All throughout Magic's history. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, I, one of our final questions here we have is uh, if you could send your 18-year-old self a message, uh, what would it be? Well, my answer should be, <laughs> don't tell them anything. Oh, sure. It worked out just fine. <laughs> um, and uh, and uh, yeah, you don't know what that message is gonna do. But uh, if I were able to send that message, I might not be able to resist uh, telling, telling my 18-year-old self to uh, to folk keep attempt uh, keep trying to learn to like everything and study things which are outside of your comfort zone. Mm. Okay, that's what I did, and it worked very well. But there were probably some times when I doubted myself. Sure, sure. At eighteen, did you know was game design already a passion of yours in gaming, or was this something that kind of evolved from there? Um, games were a passion, and uh, game design was a passion too, but uh, at, at 18, um, when I was just going into college, I did a reality check and it just seemed like uh, it was not a good place to stake your future. Uh, so, so it went uh, into the hobby, the hobby pile, and, uh, and I, 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 I Intended to leave it there as a hobby, which I uh, took seriously, but um, but wasn't planning to make it a career. Uh, and and it wasn't until and, and in fact, uh, when I first connected with Wizards of the Coast, um, it was through a friend, Mike Davis, who was trying to sell one of my game designs, Robo Rally. Mm -hmm. um, which uh, the reason why I wasn't selling it is because I knew it wasn't going to be a career. I didn't think it was going to be a career. <laughs> and I said, look, you know, you, 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 you get this published and you can have half of it. And, uh, and, uh, and he loved the game Robo Rally. And so he, looked, he, he, he tried to do this for seven years. It was a long time. Wow. He was trying to find a buyer for, uh, for Robo Rally. And uh, that's what connected me to Wizards. And, uh, and, and then, you know, magic happened. Literally. <laughs> Um, so, obviously you're Richard Garfield, PhD. What is your PhD in? It's in uh, uh, combinatorial mathematics. Wow, okay. And uh, uh, the uh, st story behind the PhD there, uh, I, I, uh, I think that, uh, I, I read somewhere, and I think that this is true, that, that when you've got a doctorate, uh, that being addressed as a doctor is only proper when it's in the context of your studies or your discipline. Okay. And so, and so for that reason, I don't go by Dr. Garfield because I'm not doing mathematics. Okay. And uh, um, the first version of Magic got printed, Richard Garfield, PhD, and and I said oh, I don't want I don't want that there. I don't think that's appropriate. Uh, it looks like egghead games. <laughs> and uh, and so then then when it was being reprinted. 
uh, I got sent the proofs and it said Richard Garfield PhD and I you know, crossed it out and said change this and it went back to the we went back to the proofreaders and they saw some other changes which need to be made and so they changed those and then they accidentally included this thing so two times in a row it got in and then that became a joke and that's why we've got uh, the card the, the, yeah the, uh, Feldegriff is a, a, an anagram of Garfield PhD and uh, uh, the card Garfield PhD so gotcha so a, a lot of players always ask uh, you know how do I become a game designer what things should I do? What should I study in school? And it sounds like you had a path that was separate from game design, but ultimately really fed into how you design and your kind of creative work as well. Uh, what advice would you give to young people who are, are coming up to that point, are you know turning 18, and are trying to make that decision of, okay, is it realistic to become a game designer? Should I put it in the hobby box? What skills should I acquire to be able to do that and maybe also consider other things? What kind of advice would you give to those people? Well, for oh, excuse me. Um, I think uh, should it be in a hobby box? Uh, that's uh, I, I firmly believe that was the answer back in the '80s and uh, and uh, the early '90s when when I made the decision and I just got tremendously lucky. Um, and for ten years after that, that was probably the answer. Now, I mean, games really are a place you can find a career now. Uh, the world has completely changed, so uh, so I don't think it's an unrealistic dream anymore. Uh, um, it's uh, very competitive. Like uh, I mean, uh, it, any place this is any career that's in a desirable field, like Hollywood or game design or writing, is going to be super competitive. But it's doable, and uh, and there's a lot of uh, uh, ways to go about it now, which I'm. Probably not the best person to talk about, uh, but uh, you know uh, things like Kickstarter and uh, you know uh, crowdfunding. You can go, you can self-publish way more easily than you could right. in the past. Um, so, what, what's good preparation for such a career? Um, I think my philosophy there would still be relevant, which is that uh, is that that there is no one answer, and that you should view game design as sort of being like writing. You don't look at a writer, I mean, you, you, you want the writer to know the English language and know literature, which means, uh, or whatever language they're writing in, um, uh, which uh, which means the an analog to that for a game designer is you should know how to play games and you should play a lot of games. You should know what games are out there. I think that's very important. But outside of that, what is the writer going to draw on? They're going to draw on everything, right? What and uh, and and so when I was in college, I took you know classes in music theory and conflict re resolution and uh, <laughs> in evolution and uh, in all sorts of different areas of philosophy. I took them. It was all over the map, and and it wasn't just mathematics that was relevant, which a lot of people think he's like sure. oh he's a, a game designer because he's got this you know it's like he must be using all his advanced math in these games. <laughs> uh, it was useful, but everything was useful. Great. Uh, well, that kind of wraps up the time we have today, but thank you so much for coming in to chat with us. Uh, and you guys, it, thank you so much for asking your awesome questions. Uh, Richard Garfield, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.